Thank you, Tracy. What a wonderful, wonderful morning to greet Dr. Diana Puñales, who is straight out of La Perla de las Antillas. Um, and she herself is a treasure to New York City and to mental health and for people who are doing what people have always tried to do, find a life of happiness and meaning. Um, Dr. Puñales, people have read your amazing, shining um, biography, uh, but I do wanna say that you are bilingual. And like I said, from Cuba, um, you're a Lat Latinx Cuban born licensed psychologist in the state of New York and highly, highly educated. Um, a Bachelor of Arts from Bernard Barnard College, Columbia University, a master's degree of science from Sarah Lawrence University and a PhD from Teachers College, Columbia University. Um, not only um, do you bring uh, people peace and serenity and a way forward and finding their own path to clarity and joy, but you teach teachers and counselors to do the same. So um, not only you heal, but you teach the healers, which is the highest level of any profession to develop a craft and an awareness um, and a discipline at a high level, but then to be able to teach it is the highest skill set of all. So it is, it's a wonderful pleasure. I wanted to tell you, Dr. Pugnali, at the heart of our mission um, is, is that we seek to teach people, including the adults here, to adapt, to change, and to create and share a life of deep meaning, dynamic virtue, and transcendent joy. Um, you do the same, and you have done the same in your own life, and we're so grateful to have you here on this uh, cold March morning, bringing light and warmth to our audience. Thank you so much for this incredibly warm um, welcome. And I feel I have to admit something. I am incredibly jealous. I want to have been at East Harlem School. Absolutely. I am like, why wasn't this there when I was growing up? I, I, so I have to manage my feelings of jealousy this morning because I absolutely love every single aspect of the work that you're doing. Because one word that comes to mind for me is that it is transformative. Um, and that's, if, if, that, if we can hit that goal, we're golden. And so let me introduce a little, myself a little bit more so that you all have a sense of who I am and what I do. And then I would love to open it up for questions. Um, I know that just earlier before this, I had really incredible questions from students. So I, as Ivan said, my name is Diana Puñales. Um, I was born in Cuba and I came to this country when I was about six and a half, almost seven years old. Um, and when we came to this country with my, I lived with my mother, father and grandmother in Cuba. And when we came here, we continued um, to live together. But as what happens to, I imagine many immigrant families that come from outside, um, my family didn't know English. So I was the first person in my family, not only to get higher education, but to learn to speak English. So from a very young age, I was my family's interpreter. We would call those today case managers because not only did I interpret for my family, but I helped my families, for example, learn how to get food stamps. I enrolled myself in Head Start and then I enrolled my sisters in Head Start um, and all the other kinds of things, Medicaid, et cetera, et cetera, housing that families do in order to survive. But when you're a little kid that you're doing it, it feels incredibly hard right? Because you yourself are a little kid and having to negotiate all of that stuff for your family feels like a huge responsibility. And so for me, one of the ways that I think I handled the stress of being a little kid doing all of that is that I really loved reading. And I had a teacher who encouraged me, um, who said, you love to read. Why don't I give you this, these books? And that started what I call my love affair with reading. And by the time I got to eighth grade, I was like reading books at a college level because it was my escape, right? 
It was my source of comfort. It helped me to imagine a world beyond what I was living. And so when you do that, it becomes this very powerful experience because you learn what is what else is out there, what other opportunities can be offered. And I was, and I consider myself really fortunate because with the school that I was in at that time, um, going back a really long time, Yvonne might remember this, they didn't always have programs to help students who didn't know English. So I didn't learn English until I was in the second grade. Um, and I remember, I'll share with you a really poignant experience when I started um, in first grade, because I did Head Start Kindergarten, that I knew nothing because it was all in English. But I was called, like they called their the names, like attendants, and I was the last kid left out in the schoolyard because the way they pronounced my name was Diana Parales. And my name is Diana Puñales. And as a little kid, I couldn't figure out who Diana Parales was. So I was left alone, like I was there and like I see people getting called and called and called. And that memory, which happened decades ago, is a memory that I still remember. Um, and it shows you the impact that early experiences that a person has growing up shape them. And so because I love to read and I was reading ahead of because it's literally all I do like and we lived in a place and that didn't have access to a playground. I didn't have access to a backyard. My mother as an immigrant really didn't know, and my father was working in factories, my, so he was never available. So my mother didn't know what to do with us. And so being the good kid, the older first kid, I just read and read and read and read. But that really helped me because it helped me then apply for scholarships that allowed me to go to college because my parents didn't have any money or access. I filled out my own college applications, my financial aid resources. You know, the parentified child, the parent, the child who becomes a parent continues, right, throughout your lifetime. And so what made the difference for me and allowed me to enter the different professions that I have in my life was that I had really good mentors, people that were invested in helping me reach my potential. And I am so grateful for that. And I think that is one of the reasons I know that that is one of the reasons why I find it so important to do the same for others that are coming up. Because without the support and mentoring that I received, I wouldn't have been able to achieve my dreams, right? Like somebody had to first believe in me and saw that I had the potential, but I needed a lot of support because my family just didn't know. They simply, they were overwhelmed themselves with coming to a new country, not knowing the culture, not knowing the language, not knowing how to access resources. And so if it wasn't for that kind of support that I received outside of my home, I'm honest, I don't think that I would have been able to even graduate, go to college, graduate college, then, because I had a love of science, somebody at my college guided me in the direction to become a genetic counselor and helped me to apply for scholarships to be able to pay for my master's. And then, after working with, I was a genetic counselor, so I worked with families and children that were at risk of having genetic conditions. And I love that work because I love science, um, but it was limited. I only was able to see the families and children for very short sessions. So I decided I got to do this for longer because I really love this work. And that's how I became a psychologist. Um, I love being able to help somebody find their way. I love being able to help someone not just find their way, but reach their full potential. Because there's so many reasons why someone may not be able to do that. It could be related to family, it could be related to community, it could be related to the person's learning style. But unless we can help the person figure that out, they got to do it by themselves. And to be quite frank, that kind of sucks if you're in this by yourself. You really need to be able to access. But it took me a long time even to know how to ask for help because... I, it, wasn't in, it wasn't modeled for me. Like my parents didn't know how to ask for help. So I never knew how it was to ask for help. I just knew that I had to do things for them, right? And so learning to trust, 
learning to ask for help didn't mean that I was any less strong or any less competent, but it meant that there were people that could really help me be able to be what I wanted to be. And that was life-changing for me. And so I have a very special place in my heart and in the work that I do in working with families um, who are, whose children are first generation, whose children face the challenges of not perhaps having parents or families that are fluent English speakers for children and adolescents who have to negotiate life in the world on behalf of their parents and families and their caregivers, because these are experiences that help shape you, but could also feel like such a huge responsibility. Um, so I love what I do. Absolutely love. I feel blessed. Like sometimes I think, wow, I actually get to make a living out of doing something that I love. Like I feel like such a blessing, right? It's such a treasure that's been given to me. And so at this point, I would love to open it up and see what questions or comments or ideas you have. Thank you so much, Dr. Punyalis. That was amazing. And we have so many questions for you. So we're excited to get started. Um, our first question comes from Catherine, who you had the chance to speak with in the green room. Yes. Hola, Catherine. Hi. Hola. Um, good morning. And um, I would like to thank you for being our virtual speaker today. And I also read in your biography that some of your areas of interest include immigration and Latino psychology. The Latino community is facing so many problems such as the threat of deportation and the separation of families. My question for you is, what type of psychological impact does this have on the Latino American community? It's an excellent question, Catherine. Um, one of the things that I work with families and, and most of the families that I have worked with are Latinx families is for the families that are here and have been authorized and documented to be here, just because they are able to be here doesn't mean that they don't experience the discrimination and the oppression that the rest of the Latinx community in the United States experiences. Because when the outside world looks at a person, they often make generalizations across the board and say, everybody who is of a particular group acts this way or is this way. And so there's an underlying stress that continues to be experienced by a significant number of Latinx families across the United States. What are some of the problems that we see? We see an increase in the level of anxiety. We see an increase in the level of re-traumatization, meaning that the person originally had an event, something that happened to them that was really traumatic. Um, and they've been able to manage, it was in the past, but now when you start hearing in the news, recent deportations, family separations, it triggers those past memories of trauma as if they were being experienced today. And some of the symptoms of trauma come back to the person. And we obviously also see levels of depression that have increased. And, not just, and, and all this thing is not just because of the pandemic, but because of what you hear and you see in the news that is happening in the world. Right. And it's not just to obviously families that are Latinx, it's happening to families, to black families and to Asian families. Um, we're experiencing a time in our history where the level of racism and oppression is now explicit. And I want to be careful to say it's not that it was never there. It was always there. It wasn't as explicit. So that's the only difference. It's not like that there's more, it's that it's always been there, except now there's actually, for some people in the United States, a lot of pride about being in this way. So one of the things that's really important about Latinx psychology is to understand the impact that culture and cultural meanings have on psychology. So some of the challenges that I face when I work with Latinx families is that some of the parents will come to me and say, why does my child need to speak to a therapist? My child is not mijo, no está loco. My child is not crazy, right? Because sometimes there's a lack of understanding or misinformation in the community that says 
if you go see a psychologist, is because there's something terribly wrong with the person, right? In fact, it would be wonderful if every one of us um, could have had an opportunity to speak with a psychologist or a mental health clinician. I can tell you myself, I think my life would have been a tiny bit easier had I been able to be in therapy when I was a child to help me manage a lot of the responsibility that was thrown upon me, right? Alone, like I had no, I couldn't tell my parents because they needed me, right? So I would then be burdening them because they were burdening me. And so having an opportunity to talk about what you're feeling, what you're thinking, the kinds of actions and decisions that you're making to somebody that's objective would, would have been really important. So those are some of the challenges, Catherine. I don't know if I answered exactly what you were asking, but helping Latinx families, especially the ones that are new to this country or haven't been here as long, who still are negotiating for themselves what it is like to live in the United States in the society and in the culture that we have here, learning and you know becoming fluent in a separate language. How does culture and cultural obligations and cultural responsibilities, how do they impact the child, the adolescents and the family's well-being? Right, because sometimes our what we think culturally doesn't necessarily translate into that it's psychologically healthy, right? Thank you so much for that. Um, and we have another question that's sort of a follow-up question to that, um, if that sounds okay. It comes from Sit Lolly. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. A lot of people from ethnic backgrounds don't seek mental health services. This could be because it is a stigma in certain cultures or that there aren't really enough psychologists from the same background. And this could make it hard for them to open up. So my question for you is, how do we as a community overcome this challenge and begin to prioritize mental health? This is an excellent question. So there are many um, communities, um, BIPOC communities, communities that are racially and ethnically part of the minoritized groups in the United States that um, feel the stigma of having mental illness. And in many ways, the psychiatric world has contributed to why there is a stigma. Many you know, several decades ago, and, and even till today, you know, what has happened with the institutionalization of individuals that are undergoing psychological problems or mental illness, um, experimentation that has been done historically on racial and ethnic groups contribute to some of the stigma. The other piece to stigma, in addition to that, which is significant, is the thought that if you have psychological symptoms or problems or a mental health issue that somehow you're either crazy or weak or there's something inherently wrong with you and we know that that's not the case but that is what stigma does when there is the stigma then it makes you more hesitant more ambivalent even afraid to seek out the help that you need and so what do we need to do as a community, right? And part of what we need to do as a community is to deconstruct, to say, you know, so, so yeah, I want to talk to somebody because I'm not feeling so good lately, right? And so to be able to empower, especially our children and our adolescents to say, I do want to talk to somebody. I, it, it's hard to talk to my family, not because I don't love them, but because they're my family. And some of the issues that I'm having is precisely because of my family, right? Because I heard some parents tell me, I don't know why my child doesn't want to talk to me. You know, I'm always here for them. I sacrifice for them. I work for them. They should be able to come to me and tell me exactly what they want. Well, if you're sacrificing for them and you're doing everything you can, it's probably going to make it a little harder for your child to then tell you, hey, mom, or hey, dad, I'm kind of having a hard time. Because the expectation is that if I, the parent, am sacrificing to give you a better life, then everything should be hunky-dory. Everything should be perfect. And we know that that's not reality, right? And parents may have their own experiences of guilt, of perhaps feeling that they want to do more for their children, but they're not able to, 
of perhaps being present for their children in a way that they simply can't right now or, or haven't been able to. And so, so the, that's the piece of the stigma. The other piece of the question that I was just asked had to do is that there are not enough psychologists or mental health workers. And so this is why I, I think it was Tracy this morning who asked, who was sharing that she and her sister are interested in psychology. That is exactly what we need to do more of. So how do we support adolescents and teenagers like Tracy right, who have an interest in psychology, and let's figure out how to create opportunities so that when Tracy gets to high school, she's able to take an introductory to psychology class. And how do we work with college counselors to help Tracy when she's in, in high school identify colleges that provide the kinds of majors that she's interested in in the clinical experiences? You know, one of the things that I do at City College is City College, the biggest major at City College is psychology. 1,500 undergraduates at City College are studying psychology. City College is also considered one of the gems of the CUNY City University of New York system because we have the most diverse campus. 75% of our students identify as BIPOC, which is huge. But if you happen to be BIPOC and you happen to come from a home where it's not so easy just to volunteer for free, you don't have opportunities to build your resume. So how do you get the good internships if you don't have an opportunity to volunteer at other places to show your interest in psychology? So what we, folks like me, folks like Anna, fo folks like Dr. Hagman, uh, Ivan, right, have to do, is we have to help create these opportunities. So I, in my clinic, what I do is I open up opportunities for undergraduates to be therapeutic aides. And a therapeutic aide is a student who then gets matched to a doctoral student to work with them with the family that they're treating. And so those are the kinds of things we have to create a pipeline so that students from very diverse and rich backgrounds. And I don't mean rich in terms of money, I mean rich in terms of culture and ability and talent are then able to come into the community because I cannot tell you the number of times that a patient has said to me, I, gracias, that you can speak Spanish. And I'm saying to myself, it shouldn't be a gracias, thank God that you can speak Spanish. Like it, it should be like a basic human right. You should be able to receive treatment in the language that you are familiar with. I don't mean to preach, but this should be a basic right, right? There shouldn't be, there in psychology, 5% of all psychologists nationwide are Black or Latinx. How? It's 2021. So we need, we, Diana, Ivan, and we need to support your interests and your endeavors because we got to get you out there and we got to get you trained like this, right? Um, for this year in the class that we just accepted yesterday at City College, for the first time in the history of our program, there we accepted 14 people. This has never happened before. Uh, 11 of them identify as BIPOC and three of them identified as white Americans. It has never happened since 1966. And we really pushed hard and we really, really went to administration and said, this has to change and it has to start with us. So the stigma question, incredibly important, the representation that we need. So I am banking that in a couple of years when some of the eighth graders are in high school, you're you're going to go to Ivan and you're going to say, what is Diana's phone number? Because I want to do, uh, I want to volunteer in her clinic because I need to get volunteer experiences on my resume so that I can get a good internship out there. But we got to create these opportunities for you. I hope that answered a little bit of your question. Absolutely. We love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, we're going to go next to Tracy, who has a great question for you. Hi, Tracy. Hi, good morning. So over the past year, we have seen a lot of the physical effects that COVID-19 has brung. And as a psychologist, what do you think has been some of the physical, physical effects? And um, yeah. Sure. So, so, so it's a two part, I, I, in my mind, it's a two part. So Tracy, one is the physical effects of COVID, 
for individuals that unfortunately may have contracted the illness. And then it's also the physical effects of COVID for individuals, the rest of us that haven't contracted COVID. So the first one is a little bit easier to talk about because we are already, and I was just reading an article in the New England Journal of Medicine this morning that talked about now that the disease has been going on for several months, they are now seeing what are called the long haulers for COVID-19. And we are seeing psychiatric conditions. The brain has changed in individuals that have had COVID-19. Not everybody experienced it in the same intensity, but we're seeing personality changes, irritability, significant memory loss, decreased ability to concentrate, decreased ability to focus and decreased ability to attend. In addition to a range of physical problems from COVID-19 survivors, they're less able, they get short of breath, incredibly easy, increased heart palpitations. Um, and there, and some people are reporting, which is really strange, prolonged neurological impairment where some parts of their body feel numb. Right. So this is these are the physical effects in people that have the disease. And now they have to continue to study this because they want to see, are there specific antiviral medications that we can give at this point? Do they need physical therapy? What kind of rehabilitation programs do we need to create for people that survived COVID-19? So that's one part of the question. The other part is, what are the physical, what is the physical impact to people that didn't get COVID-19, but we have been stuck sheltering at home, quarantining, decreased movement. And it is real. The number of people, and I'm trying to remember, Tracy, what was the percent that I read? There's been an increase in being overweight and in obesity, never before seen in this country. Like Tracy, like if I, if I don't force myself to walk, I can sit in this chair for 12 hours a day doing Zoom sessions and teaching, literally. And, and, and sometimes my daughter or my husband comes in and says, could you leave the room? And because we're all sedentary, what are the problems with being sedentary? Increased risk of heart disease, increased risk of movement disorders, increased risk of rheumatoid and arthritis symptoms, increased risk of blood sugars being high because you're eating and you're not moving around. And then, of course, when you're physically active, your mind clears, right? It's, it's think about everything that all of you do at the East Harlem School, from the morning meditation to the hours of outside activity to the exercise that is built in to your day. Throw all of that away and just stick you guys in a classroom. Can you imagine the impact that that has psychologically on your mind, your thinking, your ability to do schoolwork. Um, and so Tracy, it's a really important question. Like we sort of have to take the East Harlem model and implement that nationwide and not just for kids and, and teenagers. We need to implement this for workplaces, right? Can you imagine Ivan, if you took this model and you said in a workplace, we start the workday with the meditation and we built in, even if it's not two hours, half an hour, everybody outside walk right? It would literally change the health of the country. Thank you so much for that. We completely agree. <laughs> and uh, we'll go to our next question. Um, and it comes from Adriana. As a, Hi. As a psychologist who works with vulnerable communities, there has been a lot of trust between you and your patients. What are some strategies to build this trust? Wow, that's an incredible question. Um, just yesterday, I did an evaluation um, with a student, a doctoral student, with a young man um, who was really quite um, distrustful and paranoid. And part of the, the strategies that we have to use is to figure out what is distrust because they have been dealt really a bad deck of cards, right? Like they've been dealt really bad experiences in the world and how could they possibly trust when the world is trustworthy, it is not trustworthy versus what is distrust that feels more in the realm of paranoia, of being paranoid. And so one of the things that I use as a technique is that I am always upfront with the patient 
and I tell them who I am and what I am going to do. And then I ask them, what were you expecting? What would you like from your treatment, from your session with me today? Because I want to know, I may have an idea of what I think the patient needs, but I want to know what the patient thinks that they need. And this way, we're able to meet each other in the same place. Because they might think that they're coming to me because I am going to fix their problems. And I think that they're coming to me because they just lost their grandparent and they're grieving, right? And they're experiencing that loss. So one of the things that I think builds trust is you're always up front with the patient never ever lie or mislead a patient because even if you're not my patient, even if you're my friend and you start lying to me, that's it, right? I can't trust you anymore. So always be upfront, always be as clear as you can be. Never promise to do something for someone that you're not able to come through with. So I can't tell a patient, I promise that you're never going to feel depressed after 10 sessions with me. What I can promise is that I'm going to be here to listen I am going to be here to process and I'm going to be here to work with you so that together we can figure out what needs to happen in order for you to feel better. So those that's sort of like my recipe in getting patients to, to trust me. Um, Thank you, it's so fascinating. Um, all right, we're gonna go next to Alexa. E, hi, Alexa. Hola. Buenos Hola. Días. Buenos dias. Um, when I'm older, I hope to do work that helps immigrants in the United States. What advice would you give to someone who wants to pursue community-based work? So this is near and dear to my heart. So um, if you are interested in working with immigrant populations and doing community-based work, there are so many different avenues for you to pursue and begin exploring. You can pursue this through obviously mental health work, right? And you can, there are different ways. You could be a psychologist, you could be a social worker, you could be a mental health counselor. And that's one area. The other areas, Alexis, are, for example, through law. So um, one of the things that I do uh, like as a, myself as a volunteer is that I do psychological evaluations for individuals that are coming to this country that are immigrants and are seeking asylum. And so I work closely with attorneys and their attor the law is another way to really help communities that need legal representation so that they know what their rights are. Just because you may not have the documents that you need and the authorization that you need to be in this country does not mean that you do not have rights. You still have rights in this country, still, still, okay? But a person may not know that. And being able to know what are your rights, what falls into the purview is really critical. And the other piece to help, especially um, immigrant uh, population, especially through community-based work, is actually through teaching, because there is nothing more powerful for um, for any community is to have their members have access to really good education, right? And and always remember, education and knowledge are power. And not only is education and knowledge power, education and knowledge are love. And I think that that's one of the things that I know your school is really important on. So there are, one of the ways to do this, Alexa, is that when you get to high school, really speak to your guidance counselor and say, what are some of the community-based organizations that this high school has partnership with? Because I would like to start, you'll start off volunteering right? Sometimes the way you get your leg in is even by saying, I would like to interpret, right? And then from there, you build a resume so that when you go to college, then you'll have even greater opportunities to join organizations that specifically work with the kind of populations that you're interested in doing community-based work with. And um, it's an incredibly rewarding work um, that it's, you know, it, it's incredibly satisfying. All of the work that I've ever done that has been community-based has always helped me to grow um, and to really do service for others. That's a great question, Alexa. 
That's wonderful advice. Thank you so much. Um, our next question comes from Marlon. Hey, Marlon. Hola, buenos dias. Hola, buenos dias. I read in your biography that you will soon be of the new initiative at the City College of New York, which will center on training doctoral students to conduct psychological evaluations for individuals seeking asylum in the United yes. States. Yes. What are some of the ways that you think psychological evaluation will help asylum seekers? This is a great, great question, Marlon. So um, seeking asylum is a complicated process. It's different than the immigration process because seeking asylum means that the individuals that are seeking asylum to the United States have experienced very specific circumstances and events in their home country. When you have only an attorney involved, um, the attorney is going to obviously present hopefully the strongest case that they can about how come this particular individual or family need asylum and need to stay in the United States. When you add, Marlon, the psychological evaluation piece, you are able to demonstrate much more conclusively two things, two things. What has been the impact of the experiences that that individual or family had in their country, in the psychological and physical well-being of the person, you can document that and you can say, not only did they go through this, but look at the consequence to their mental health, right? And number two, you can also, from the psychological evaluation say, if this person or family was to be deported, was to be denied asylum, this is what's going to happen to them when they return and the psychological impact that they're having, that they're experiencing, they will not be able to get any treatment for in their home country because this was where they experienced their trauma, right? And so when you are able to add the psychological evaluation to the asylum seeking process, you're bolstering, you're increasing that person's or family's opportunity to be uh, um, granted asylum. It could often be, Marlon, the one piece that really cements the case for that person or family. So, so that's, that's what has been our experience. If it wasn't for the pandemic, the, that's last summer, the summer of 2020, um, a group of students and I were going to go to the border to be able to help the attorneys that are at the border conduct psychological evaluations so that at that moment where they're having the legal representation, a psychological evaluation could be done. And at that point, even before they're in the United States, the, the, process, the, you know, the powers that be would be able to have all of that information. And then of course the pandemic hit. Um, Thank so. you for that, Dr. Punialis, and thank you for such powerful work. It's really amazing to hear you speak about it. Um, all right, we're going to go next to Sochiket Sali. Hello. Hello. Buenos dias. Hi, buenos dias. A lot of my classmates and I are children of immigrant parents. My question for you is, what advice would you give children of immigrants as they try to navigate their way through school and work in the United States? So this is a question that is near and dear to my heart because I too um, am the child of immigrant parents. Um, I myself am an immigrant. Um, so my advice, um, and, I, and, I, and I wish that somebody had been able to tell me sooner, was to really learn how to ask um, for help because I think that for Growing up, it was really difficult. Sometimes I had a lot of shame or embarrassment. Um, and I anticipated that people may have said no to what I needed. So I didn't ask. And my parents who didn't know the language, who didn't know the culture, didn't even know how to guide me to learn how to ask. And so um, being able to step forth and say, hey, I'm going through a hard time, or hey, I need a little bit of help with this, I think would have made 
um, especially my childhood and early teen years, a lot more safe and um, a lot more um, calming for me. I, I was a pretty anxious kid. And so what if some of the advice is ask for help, read. Read was, my, was one of the things that helped me tremendously because by reading, I learned about so many things that, that my family just didn't, didn't know about or didn't have access to, right? Um, and also being the first one to go to college in my family was really significant because when I, when I wanted to become like a psychologist, my family even said, but why do you need more school? Didn't you take classes in psychology? Like they didn't know. They thought that just by taking classes in psychology, you become a psychologist. So I had to, or a genetic counselor. So I had to educate them about what it was like um, to, you know, so I, I had to do a lot of education, but it's also a heavy burden. So being able to turn to support, such as your teachers, social worker, and sometimes even talking to, to friends about it, like, you know, how to figure stuff out. One of the things that I also learned really, um, especially when I got to college, how important it is to make connections with others that are like me. Because the sense of I am the only one that is going through this hard time can be really isolating. But being part of groups, of student groups, where others are also going through sometimes something similar, is really helpful. It helps you feel less alone and less that everything only falls on your shoulders, that there are other shoulders that can also help with the responsibility. And sometimes it might even feel like a burden. It's a lot to carry around all the time. Um, and, and I think by being able to reach out to others also then helps families and parents see how complex it is for the student, the person to do this on their own. Seeking opportunities through volunteering, joining clubs and organizations. In every one of those, you're gonna meet people that are going to give you hopefully a hand up. One, you know, I, I wouldn't be the director of the training clinic at City College if it wasn't because one of my supervisors, when I was studying, I became really friendly and I really trusted them. And I began to share with them my story and my journey. And then I, I graduated and years later, they called me and said, hey, there's an opening here. You would be perfect for this. But it was because I trusted and I opened up to them and I built a relationship and I, and I wasn't afraid to ask for help. And they remembered that. Um, and that's part of what connections, you all might have heard the word networking, right? Meeting people, putting yourself out there and taking a risk. And sometimes it's hard to do. Um, it's not always so easy. Wonderful. And um, we want to be mindful of your time, Dr. Punyalis. Do you have time for two more questions this morning? Yes, yes, of course. Great. Okay, we're going to go next to Geraldine. Hi, Geraldine. Hola, buenos dias. Hola, buenos dias. Um, can you tell us what acculturated, acculturative stress is? When sure. did you become interested in studying it? And what are some things that you have learned that help relieve this type of stress? The acculturative stress is the experience that individuals within the same family have with each other and also with the outside world in respect to when the person's own cultural values and the development of their cultural identity can clash either with that of their families or with that of the outside world and the outside communities. And that clash where you don't see eye to eye in the same way causes profound stress in the individual and it looks like anxiety symptoms. So I'll give you a quick a quick example, right? Um, my parents were very, very traditional, right? And very, very strict. So when I started dating, I could only date if my two younger sisters came with me on every single date that I had, right? 
you can imagine how uncool and unpopular I was, right? Because I was the kid who had to do that. Um, and part of it for me was in, in, in Cuba, right? That was the system. They had chaperonas, chaperones. And you had a chaperona until you got married. The people that I was dating, it wasn't because I was going to marry them. I didn't even know them yet. I was just sort of dating to get to know people. Um, and so I would get really angry um, and felt how unfair and how unjust it was because the rest of my friends who didn't have such traditional strict parents, they could go to the movies, they could go out on dates, and yet I couldn't, right? And that produced in me tremendous amounts of stress and anxiety and anger, right? What are some of the ways to manage acculturative stress? One of the ways is obviously to have the support of a mental health professional that could help you make sense. What is going on? Why am I feeling this way? The other is to have conversations with the family members, right? And to be able to sit down and say, I understand, right? Like I wish I had had somebody to have guided me, to have helped me be able to have the conversation with my parents that said, I understand that this is how it was like in Cuba, but I am here and I need you to trust that you raised me in such a way that I have but good values for myself, that I need you to trust my judgment about what I will and will not do, right? Because some of the clashes come around fear that something bad is going to happen to my kid, my kid's going to do something bad, my kid is not old enough to make good decisions for themselves. And some of the acculturative stress does revolve around trust. And so you know, being able to have these conversations. And sometimes you're going to have parents who say, I don't want to have a conversation. I'm the parent. I decide. It's my rules. And that's it. And being able, I wish I had someone that would have been able to say to me, to say to your parent, I understand that. And I wish that we could still talk about this. Because I know that you want what's best for me. But I need you also to trust me that you as my parents have done a good job raising me and give me the chance to make my choices and my decisions. But I wouldn't have known that. And, and I didn't have somebody, as I said, I wish I had had a psychologist that would have been meeting with me that would have helped me be able to phrase things. And even sometimes just to speak to the parents themselves, right? Like if they weren't listening to me because I was una chamaquita, right? Like I didn't know who I was, right? But they would have trusted another adult to be able to help us have these kinds of conversations. So those are the ways that I would ask you um, to think about acculturative stress and not to deny that they themselves are afraid. They don't know the culture and what they see is that this culture in the United States goes against their values. You know, I can't tell you the number of times that my parents would say to me, nosotros no somos americanos, we're not Americans. They're the ones that let their kids go out and do whatever. And at the time that I came to this country, it was like, you know, I don't know if you heard word, the word hippies and people were walking around barefoot and girls weren't wearing brassiers and everybody was smoking weed. And so my parents were so afraid that I was going to start doing that, that they doubled down, right? They locked me in. Um, so, but it came from a place of fear, not understanding of the unknown. Now I can help the children and teens that we work with have these kinds of conversations with their parents and families. Thank you so much. And we'll go to our final question now. It comes from Yuritsi. Hi. Uh, hola. Hi. Yes. Hola, Yuritsi. I would like to thank you for being our virtual speaker today. A lot of kids in middle school and high school throughout the US and the world face challenges with self-esteem, especially kids who come from marginated, marginalized communities. What are some ways that kids can, can overcome this challenge? So this is yet another great question. Um, I think what's so important about what you just asked is that self-esteem is at the core of how we develop as persons. And it requires the individual to have a sense of self that is real 
and that is positive and that is strong. And you are right when you say that there are a significant number of children and young adults from marginalized communities that suffer endemic low self-esteem. When society continues to demean or degrade, criminalize who you are in your community, how do you develop a positive self-esteem? So one of the ways that we can begin to do this is by having spaces, such as what happens in the East Harlem School, such as what happens in the spaces that we're trying to create, for example, at City College, where we actually give children the message, you are important and you matter, right? And you have something incredible to offer and we're here to help you figure that out. Um, and we give positive um messages about who we are from being able to pronounce your names correctly right to being able to to welcome spaces where if you don't know the word for if you speak a different language and you don't know the word in english that allows you to say something like i don't know how to say this in english but this is how i would say it right that creates those opportunities and welcomes that you know, one of the things that happened to me, and I'll tell you, it's super quick, when I was a little kid, my mother packed lunch for me, but my mother would pack lunch for me in a thermos that was Cuban food. Everybody else at the lunch table that I was at was eating freaking peanut butter and jelly or bologna sandwiches. And so when I would open my thermos of delicious arroz con pollo, like the kids were like, oh, yuck, but they didn't know. And so what did that do to my self-esteem? It made me feel bad, it made me feel odd, it made me feel strange, right? And so being able to create communities where in fact, if a kid brings a rock and pollo for lunch, we value that, like how delicious is that? And having adults around you that tell the kids who are making fun of you, stop it. Wow, isn't that delicious? Is Can you tell us what arroz con pollo is, right? Instead of it having to be a devaluing experience. And I share my personal histories with you, not because I, I want you to say, oh my God, this poor woman, she had such a hard life, whatever. It's to show you that these things happen in life, right? And self-esteem and being able to believe in yourself. And I was, re and, I says, and as I said, I was really fortunate that I had people that helped support me and that saw that I had potential and valued me and loved me and said, you can do this. Because if my self-esteem had really plummeted and had been low, that could lead to depression, that could lead to having dark thoughts about wanting to be living, right? Um, and so being able, the, the short answer is um, being able to find these kinds of supports um, in community, in school, in family, and, and, and sharing, right? Like not keeping it silent. Like when you feel bad, whatever way you can, let others that are around you know that you're not feeling well, that you're not feeling yourself. Um, so that's sort of what I would say. Thank you so much, Dr. Punales, for everything you've shared this morning. And um, we'll end today by um, taking in everything you've shared with a moment of silence, again, led by Tracy. And then Ivan will share some last remarks. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, pretty crazy. I, I, Dr. Punyale said when I when I first met you, um, you know, I you, I was immediately won over and um, and and had a an intuitive uh, sense of the depth of humanity that you have that was confirmed in, in these brief moments that we've had with you. Um, it wasn't too long ago that um, Ms. Warren had a friend come in who's a composer and a conductor, and he was talking about um, this one, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but since you're the psychologist, you can tell me, but um, 
uh, this composition by Gustav Mahler, and I, I like Gustav, but this is music is, um, it, uh, you know, a symphony can, can make you feel like you've led a, uh, lived a lifetime. And uh, I, I felt like your words and your presence and uh, just today in this moment was just this beautiful composition of and balance and, and uh, of, uh, of swagger and vulnerability um, and uh, you know, moments of, of dignity and moral outrage that you express so eloquently balanced by you know, this unswervable attention uh, to heal and uh, to bring joy to people. You are a gentle and wise warrior. I was, I was captivated uh, so much by what you said and so much by how you said it. One of the things that you said in the green room uh, in response to Tracy is uh, the, the capacity that, uh, that Adriana was getting at with her question, this, this capacity of listening with the heart. Um, you know, immediately, you know, I, I had to have a sense that you really uh, listen, I mean, you speak beautifully, but uh, how profound it is. And people say, oh, you need to speak from the heart, but I never heard or thought about in this way, the ability to listen from the heart and let people know that you're listening from the heart. So, I mean, I, I think, well, I know um, that, uh, you know, our relationship with you and your organization is gonna be wonderful, all of us and our families. And I think that this morning, if, if people, are open to it, and I'm, you know, judging by uh, the the way our students have responded, that this can be this deeply uh, transformative moment uh, that can last a lifetime. Um, different from the moment of you being left alone in the schoolyard because they were calling you um, uh, not by your name, um, but this can be one of these transformative moments where um, you know Alexa or whomever uh, will say. Uh, you know, I'm going to go deep into this healing of, of myself and the community. Uh, and, uh, and Dr. Brunialis, you um, will have been that light. Um, but uh, this is the beginning of, of a long conversation and relationship with an amazing uh, professional and human being and a humble school on 103rd Street. I am eternally grateful and uh, profoundly um, moved and uh, and I learned so much and I, I'm speaking I'm saying that and speaking on behalf of our students and faculty as well. Thank you so much, Doctor. Do you have any any final words before you no. go on your marathon? Uh, no, I, I I don't. I'm just um, profoundly awed and humbled by the East Harlem School and by all of you from the staff you know, to the students, um, what you're doing is special. And, and this is what's going to give us a new generation. Um, and we'll, I don't mean to sound corny, it's gonna really change the world. This is what we need. We're in, we're in this together. So, paz. Venceremos. Venceremos. Buen fin de semana. Gracias por Gracias. todo. Hasta pronto. Ojalá que sí. Hasta, claro que sí. Claro okay. que sí. Un beso y un abrazo a todos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.